And this is just a friendly reminder that we are now live.
I have 10 uh, a.m. and good morning. Welcome, everyone. I would like to call the Finance Government Operations Committee, FGOC Committee meeting to order at this time. I am Supervisor Otto Lee, Chair of this committee, along with Vice Chair Supervisor Susan Allenberg. With both supervisors present, we have a quorum. And then we go to item number two of the agenda, which is public comments, which is uh, reserved for members of the public to address the committee on any items that's not on this agenda. And uh, those who would like to speak uh, something regarding not the agenda uh, on the agenda, please uh, speak this time. How many uh, speakers do we have for comments? We currently have no speakers um, in chambers, but we do have one on Zoom. Okay, all right. Let's go ahead and set the three minutes for that one speaker for Zoom. Great. Paul Soto, you will have three minutes to speak. The timer will begin once you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Supervisor Lee and Ellenberg. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I would like to talk about, in a very general terms, um, the uh, Zoom at commission meetings. Um, I was at the first meeting when I was very disappointed that it was just like dropped on the public that only certain meetings will have Zoom, certain meetings we won't have Zoom. And, and I was very concerned about that. And because what it did is it it hampered and impeded the ability of seniors that participate in some of these commissions. They stay actively engaged in their elder years. And what this does is it deprives the county of the, the rich capacity that our elders have in our communities to chime in with their wisdom and their knowledge of city government. I mean, these are not seniors that just chime in because they have nothing else to do. These are seniors that have been actively involved for decades in our institutions, both city and county. And so we have been consistently depriving the public of access to that knowledge and to that wisdom and to that life experience that can enhance the quality and, and, and the, they can enhance the quality of the reports that they submit to you for examination. And so this is, a, this is definitely an equity issue. Secondly, is that I would like us to like get ahead of things. This county was the one with Dr. Saracotti's, uh, Dr. Saracotti, the first in the nation is what put the stop to, to uh, COVID by putting, I don't know what you call it, but she instituted a policy that stopped everything and the rest of the country followed. I would like that same kind of fervor and same kind of enthusiasm to let's get in front of the, the bills that are in, uh, the uh, assembly, let's get in front of those. You know, I don't like James Williams. I don't like him, okay? Because all he does is get on these meetings and no, no, the law, it's the law and the law says this and the law says that. I'm tired of hearing about that. There was no law when Dr. Sarah Cody instituted that policy. She just went ahead and did it because it was the right thing to do. And it was to protect the public. I don't care about the legal issues. I care about the morals and the ethics. That's what I care about. And the principles by which rhetorically this, co this uh, board says that they stand upon the principles, ethics, and morals. Well, I'm just asking that if those ethics, morals, and principles can be used in the service of making Zoom available for everybody. The county has the money. They have the money. The rest of the country is doing this. San Jose has no problem doing it. The city of San Jose because they hear my mouth all the time. So I'm just asking if we can please consider that so that we can be benefit from the rich wisdom and knowledge that is in our community. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you. Uh, so we move to item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes to the committee's agenda. Um, Supervisor Ellenberg, I would like to actually add item number five and number eight to the consent. Five is a semi-annual report from the Technology Services and Solutions Department. And item eight is for the annual report from the Harvey Ambrose Associates. And do you have any changes uh, or suggestions to consent calendar, please? Thank you. Um, I would also like to add items four and 10 to consent. I'd like to pull items 13 and 15, and here 15 concurrently with six. And I have uh, comments on 17 and 19. So let me spell all of that out um, a little bit. Um, 
uh, pulling item 15 to here with six, that's the status of capital projects along with the 10-year capital plan. Item 13 that I'm pulling is the Intergovernmental Affairs Advocacy Report. Um, the two for consent, four and 10. Four is the Fairgrounds Master Plan, 10 is the Hospital Master Plan. Uh, regarding item 10, the VMC Master Plan, I'd like to offer just a few comments on, on next steps. Um, first, with, with thanks to Jeff Draper and Paul Lawrence and their, and their teams for the report. Uh, as the board directed in February, we are preparing a study session, hopefully early in the new fiscal year, on the VMC master plan. And when we hold that session, I'd like to see how this report, the February master plan, the April VMC business plan, and the 10-year CIP fit together. Supervisor Chavez and I were assigned to form an ad hoc committee to plan the session, and I look forward to working both with Jeff Draper and Paul Lawrence to, um, to ensure that we answer any questions they may have about the alignment of those reports. My goal for the study session will be for the board to see with more clarity where we are, what's in process, what else is needed, and the justifications for uh, proposed projects so that we can be more intentional in our allocation of resources for our hospital system. On item 17, the annual financial report, I'd like to leave this on consent, but just um, offer a quick shout out of appreciation to Trish Fan, who's one of our accounting managers, and to her supervisor, Annie Tom, uh, one of our two assistant controller treasurers for their work on this report. I know that it takes months, I think six months, of collaborative work with departmental fiscal officers to pull this together. So thank you to them uh, and everyone else that I'm sure worked along with them. And finally, on item 19, the Harvey Rose audit work plan for next year, uh, I had intended, when we spoke about this last, intended the regularly scheduled audit of the district attorney administrative services office in a, in a an attorney's, not a special study. So with that um, minor correction, uh, Chairman, Chairperson Lee, we can send this to the board with a recommendation to approve. And I would make all of that um, a motion for approval of the consent calendar with direction and changes. Great, yes, yeah, so that's the motion. And just to clarify <clears throat> to everybody, we are um, adding items number four, five, eight, intent onto the consent while we're also pulling item number 13 and 15 off the consent while 15 will be heard uh, along with six. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, and I'll go and second that and uh, I would like to see if there's any members of public like to speak and address the committee on the consent calendar. We do have one virtual speaker. Okay, go ahead. Three minutes or yes. two? Paul Soto, you will have three minutes to speak. The timer will begin once you begin speaking. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. For six months prior to the discontinuance of Zoom at uh, commission meetings, I was working on the Florence Italy Commission. And what I was doing was I was challenging the commission and they were amenable to it. They wanted, they were gonna start conducting study sessions and really start learning how to institute racial equity within the context of these meetings. And the, what that was gonna look like, what I was working towards, that was stopped by the, 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 uh, the uh, impediment of no Zoom meetings, is that I was looking to get scholarships and create fundraisers, including the lowrider community. Remember, I have direct access to the entire lowrider community in the city of San Jose. And these car clubs came and they chimed in at a Zoom meeting in full support. And I had people from Arizona and people from Texas that also chimed in, professors of Chicano studies, that chimed in because what we wanted to do is start getting scholarships for kids within the context of Florence, Italy, because this is an equity issue. There's Excuse me, Ms. Soto, I'm, I'm sorry. This is about the consent calendar specifically, so I, I hope you... Yeah, there's yeah. something on Florence, Italy on the consent. If we look on the consent calendar, there's a report to receive uh, something from okay. the foreign Okay, so you're addressing that issue, okay? I just wanna make sure we are yeah. uh, kept with this issue. Okay, thank cool, you. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. And so, and so what I'm saying is that that's why it's important. I'm talking about the Florence Italy report. 
is that it's a because Zoom was discontinued from that commission. And so what they did is it stopped meetings. They haven't had any meetings because of that, because certain seniors could not participate because of a variety of issues, access to issues. And so what that did is it stopped my the momentum that I had been building up six months prior to that from instituting scholarships for kids on the east side. That was my ultimate goal. And that was stopped because Zoom was stopped, because the meetings were stopped, because seniors weren't able to access the meetings via Zoom. And so th th that's the issue. It, these issues are very, very nuanced. And it takes, it requires uh, communication, this type of communication to set the stage for it so that you can understand the context in which I'm speaking. Um, the, and, and so now that, that work is like put on hold. I'm, I'm tired of kids just from, from Archbishop Nitti, Harker, and others, all these other schools on the west side getting access to scholarship ones where they can go over to Florence, Italy and behold that beautiful art. That is the centerpiece of the Renaissance period. And, and because the lowrider community is in support of it, um, because we created in our community moving art that is worldwide, just like the Renaissance art. So can you imagine having a commission of the lowrider community connected to the Florence, Italy, and having fundraisers at Montavo? We'll have a car show at Montavo and raise money for these kids to get scholarships to go to Florence, Italy. Let's do it. Reinstitute Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we do actually have one more Zoom uh, public commenter, if you would like to take them as well. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Great. Lorraine Zeller, you will have three minutes to speak, and the timer will begin once you begin speaking. Good morning, Supervisors Lee and Ellenberg. I, um, I don't want to be overly critical, but I'm looking at the um, item six on uh, the Harvey Rose Management Report. And um, because recommendation 7.3, which was, and, and it was a great recommendation, and I'm very um, glad that it was made. It was to consider funding proposals that would provide additional support for both residents and operators of licensed RCFs and unlicensed board and care facilities into future MHSA spending plans. And um, a reason was given to not agree with that and to hold off on any uh, additional support uh, because there, there is a, an independent living empowerment project in process. And um, the answer was, or the response was to uh, wait until the learning outcomes from the, from the ILEP project came in. And so I would have liked the auditor to um, examine more closely any reasons for delay in accepting and implementing its recommendations. Um, I'm also asking you and, and very much hoping that the entire board of supervisors will override the decision to allow any delay on recommendation 7.3 as residents of independent living and unlicensed group uh, homes and both residents and operators of licensed board and care are in desperate need of support. Um, so just finally, I just wanted to ask, or I just wanted to point out that I would have liked the uh, auditor to ask how the outcomes and learning from the innovative project were related to any other possible way that funding could be provided to support um, the board and cares and the independent living. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so if that's the case, let's go take a vote for item number three. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Thank <clears throat> you. And then we move to item number, uh, since four and five have been put on consent, we're now moving to item number six which is a received report from the Office of County Executive and the Facilities and Fleet Department relating to the 10-year capital improvement program for fiscal year 2023 to 24 through fiscal year 2032 to 2033. 
and then we also hearing item number 15 uh, along with this which is receiving the semi annual report from the facilities and fleet department relating to status of capital projects and i believe uh to present this who do we have today Early, uh, uh greg Ituria, oh, County hi, budget greg. director yes. good morning i can kick off the presentation for the capital improvement program and then uh, Mr. Draper can help with uh, the next item on the capital Great, projects please. update. Mm -hmm. okay. The uh, capital improvement program is a, as, as the committee knows, a significant planning process that integrates uh, capital, operational, and long-term uh, financial planning activities throughout the county organization. It's, you know, what, in the document that's attached to any agenda packet, it, comes out and gets published concurrent with the recommended budget is has a, a number of purposes but for the committee and for the board I believe a primary purpose is to aid the board with its determination of priorities it's, it uh, addresses the county's infrastructure needs next slide please over the program's 10-year planning horizon the uh, program is targeting uh, project expenditures and identified funding sources totaling approximately 2.1 billion major projects included in that 10-year planning horizon include numerous behavioral health facility improvements and 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 planning investments uh, deferred maintenance of county uh, existing county facilities improvements to the elmwood campus uh, the development for the new adolescent psychiatric facility and behavior health services center investments in diagnostic imaging uh, throughout the healthcare system the hub at parkmore and the development for the valley health center san jose next slide please the document also serves as a st significant st strategic uh, planning uh, document as well and the strategic framework for addressing capital needs includes the utilization of county-owned property versus the reliance on uh, leased facilities and, and, and future acquisition of leased facilities. It includes the expansion of behavioral health facilities <coughs> continued investments in behavioral health and addressing critical uh, seismic investments needed in our hospital campuses. Future investments uh, leverage uh, cash contributions, uh, debt financing that we've done in the past, and uh, all of the county's uh, various funding streams that are available for use towards capital projects. The major changes since the last comprehensive update that was published one year ago includes augmentation and deferred maintenance efforts we do see that over time uh, the the longer we defer maintenance of existing facilities the more expensive and the, the greater the requirement for investment we're recognizing that and also preliminary planning for long-term custody health programming at uh, at elmwood the more seismic assessments and child care space and that concludes the introduction for item number six and if you'd like we can turn it over to mr draper for introduction of the next item good morning supervisors um jeff draper from the facilities and fleet department uh, our report shows that we have 83 active capital projects uh, funded through budget unit 263 fund 50. Um, roughly 33 of them are in construction uh, 12 are to be financially closed out. There's another 16 in the design phase, another 15 that we're working through the details of a planning phase, and a couple of others that uh, are there as well. Uh, with that, um, we also have a closed 11 capital pro projects financially since the last time we put this report for you. Uh, that's all I have for that report, and I'm ready for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, go ahead as um so, as do you have any questions on this one? I do. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Greg and, and Jeff, for, for the reports. Could you put back up uh, slide three, please? Just one moment while we put that up. No problem.
So slide three shows that behavioral health facility expansion is a priority for the overall capital uh, planned. I, I did find the summary on pages 30 and 31 to be a helpful overview of efforts to date on expanding behavioral health system capacity, but only four behavioral health projects are recommended as part of the fiscal 23-24 budget, and all of those are funded uh, with ARPA dollars. And I'm, I'm concerned about our level, uh, direct level of commitment to this area of need and our next steps that will allow us to move from consideration to actual implementation and construction. So let me just start with a, a question to, to Greta maybe. Are we still on track to receive the RAND report on, on June 6th? We are still on track to receive the RAND report on June 6th. Thank Barely, you. but yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you're in, you're in. What will the next steps look like to move from whatever that bed count is to actual pre-construction uh, planning and contracts to address whatever need is identified? Sure, so a couple things. As you saw, there's significant funding set aside for behavioral health projects, but not specifically identifying the projects, in part to make sure that we had funding set aside to act on the RAND report, but didn't presume we knew what it would tell us. Um, uh, but we um, do expect and have been really focused on subacute capacity development. And as we've talked about, um, that can look uh, like a few different things that can be um, the development of additional um, capacity in county owned facilities that can be the construction of new county owned and operated facilities or county owned facilities where a third party is operating mm -hmm. the um, care occurring in that facility or um, and I mentioned this because it's the thing that we've been pursuing um, most uh, aggressively in part because it's the thing that can come online the fastest is working with um, uh, organizations that provide subacute care and may have the ability to expand their bed capacity either in our county or for use by um, our county and placing folks. Um, so we've been very focused on that. I think we will have um, positive updates to provide the board near term on our progress on that front. Um, plus uh, the ability to leverage the funds that we've set aside as part of the capital improvement plan to immediately um, begin progress on some of the additional facility augmentation um, that may be called for under the RAND report, a lot of which um, will also be discussed on June 6th um, as part of the report from administration that follows the discussion of the RAND findings. Great, thank you, and, and I fully support um, looking at new construction as a last resort for us, not not a, a first. And I appreciated your comment about leverage and just want to ask a little bit more about that because um, I, I don't think it's a leap to assume that the need for additional beds, uh, however we get them, is going to far exceed the 12 and a half, 12.6 million in ARPA dollars in reserve in the recommended capital budget. Um, assuming that that is correct, what do you see as the primary uh, options to be able to fund identified needs? Well, I think um, I, th I think that's right, and I think it depends partly on, um, as you mentioned just prior to that comment, what path we're going down. I think that funding um, is far more close to adequate if we're looking at partnering with external entities to expand their capacity. Um, we also are um, aggressively investigating all of the state grant funding opportunities, and as you're aware, and as we're going to talk about later on this agenda, um, there are a number of state legislative efforts afoot that may create opportunities to draw down funds, repurpose, for example, MHSA funds in, in ways that once the details are solidified at the state level may make those funding streams available for purposes of these sorts of facility expansions. Um, but a huge component of what funding streams are tappable depends on what f specific facility types we're looking at and who um, would be the operator of those facilities. Um, and specifically whether we're looking at, for example, um, housing plus intensive outpatient services gives us access to certain funding streams. If we're talking about locked inpatient environments, it's very different funding streams, obviously um, depending on uh, county uh, uh, owning and operating and construction, we have some opportunities to look at, at bonds and other financing mechanisms. So 
um, a lot of, of work going on in the background to explore those alternatives, but the funding streams um, will definitely uh, flow from that. We did, though, want to set aside this $12.6 million to make sure that we had a dedicated, very significant pot of funding available to begin immediately um, uh, on whatever we can uh, flowing from that report. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. And and turning to uh, Jeff Draper, th this actually probably isn't a question you can answer until we see the RAND report, but something that I will be interested in to sort of pregame that for you is based on the recommendations, I would be very interested to know how long we should expect project scoping and design to take for any projects that we may need to be either constructing from new or significantly renovating, um, you know, whether it's something the size, and I hope it's not, of our psychiatric inpatient facility or, or, or the size of 6, 650 South Bascom. Is that something that you can um, work on to produce? I don't know if you'll, how quickly you'll see the RAND study, but either simultaneously to share on June 6th or, or soon thereafter. Good morning, Dave Barry, Chief of Planning for Facilities and Fleet. If it's okay, I'd like to answer the question. Please, um, hi Dave. Thank you. So um, we're currently contracted with a consultant and we're ready to go as soon as we get the RAN report. And what we'll do is we'll concept, uh, conduct, uh, we have um, three phases of our uh, study. One is site assessment. We have 16 county owned sites that we uh, will assess. Then um, phase two will be site suitability for the different types of behavioral health uh, uh, facilities that are outlined in the RAN report. And then finally, phase three will be conceptual design uh, for the sites that are selected. Um, we're looking at um, approximately uh, four months for phase two and four months for phase three, and we've already begun phase one. So I would say all in all about 10 months is what we're talking about here for this extensive amount of work. That's excellent. So 10 months with the clock starting when we get the RAND report. Yeah. So 10 months Correct. from the beginning of June. Great. That's, um, that's exciting. I, I want to make sure that um, the board and the public can maintain uh, visibility on that. So if, um, if it works for Supervisor Lee, I'd like to request that we do get monthly reports uh, specifically on this work, updates um, at, at FGOC, and if they are very minor updates, um, just a, a, written, uh, a written report for the agenda would be fine, when hopefully you've got lots of good news and exciting things to share, I'd like to see presentations. Yes, and it, this should align for next year's CIP so we can contemplate, you know, possible design and construction projects um, that are outcome of this assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, given the, the shared interest in this space with our uh, state and city partners, are there opportunities for expedited um, HCAI review or permitting that we should be seeking um, out to move faster on behavioral health projects? You know, I think um, there, there may be opportunities depending on, uh, well, if we're looking at third party operators and they're operating um, in cities um, where some of that permitting will occur, we're absolutely happy to. And I think you're, I, I certainly agree with your sense that there would be interest in um, on, on the part of some of our cities and seeing if they can help accelerate whatever processes may be pertinent um, within city planning and permitting, for example. Um, with respect to HCI, I think it's a little bit more um, challenging, although I do know, um, as, as you mentioned, that that is a huge priority for the state to see behavioral health facility expansion. And so, um, you know, there may be opportunities as we're doing uh, more general advocacy with the state to flag for them that in those few communities like ours where there is um, going to be and already has been an aggressive push to do facility expansion that the ability particularly for projects that are BSIP funded, for example, um, to see prioritization of um, state level review would be beneficial to get those um, facilities open in a more timely way. Thank you. And I would certainly encourage you to use the five of us 
particularly in relationships with the cities that, that we are representing, uh, let us be helpful with, with our colleagues as needed. Uh, a few more um, issues that I want to, want to address. The adult residential treatment program at 650 uh, South Bascom uh, has been a, a shared priority of Supervisor Lees and myself. Um, the project isn't listed in the capital plan or the project status for item 15. Is that because it's a county leased facility rather than our own building? Yes. And so then how can, how can the board maintain visibility on projects like these that might similarly be aligned to county priorities where we don't own the buildings? I was gonna just suggest briefly that I think um, kind of jumping back to your, your prior request for monthly reports at, um, at, at FGOC regarding uh, what may be the outcomes of the RAND report, I think we could instead just expand that to, to include any um, behavioral health related facilities projects, be they ones flowing from the RAND report or, or prior to that, um, so, so that we have one uh, vehicle for those updates to come to this committee. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Um, OK, um, I'm going to move away from behavioral health uh, with, a, with a few questions on some other, other projects. A few of them stood out in the CIP and the project status report. Uh, for the child care project budgeted at $3 million, uh, my understanding is that we're waiting on assessment findings. Can you tell me, um, Jeff or, or anybody else, what the timeline is to receive that report and, and thereafter what you anticipate as work in the upcoming fiscal year on this project? We've been working with uh, Sarah Duffy on this. I believe they're, um, they're responding more directly to this with um, uh, off agenda me memo. On the assessment report. Yeah. Anything you can add? Yeah, I, I guess I, um, I think this is just to expand on, on what Dave briefly said, the component of the child care expansion work that Sarah Duffy and her team are taking the lead on is really figuring, doing the landscape analysis of where should we be investing, what are the sorts of facilities, what are the considerations that should be at play when we're determining what, um, what approach and specific facilities are gonna actually best meet community need aligned with the board's previously articulated priorities. And then of course there's a more technical element to that, which is the um, community care licensing standards for childcare are very rigorous, very hard to meet, particularly when you're talking about um, uh, uh, for non-home-based care, for right. more um, center-based care. And so there's a whole component um, on which we're gonna be um, engaging consultants to make sure as we're doing our planning processes, we're fully, um, including uh, consideration of all of those really specific requirements because they um, very much make it much more or less feasible to include ch child care in certain facilities. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's the, the... What's the timing on that getting back to the board? I will have to get back to you on... You mean on the on the first component? or it's, um, I will have to get back to you on, on that. On completing might, the assessment and reporting on the assessment. Um, let me see if I can get you an answer okay. during this meeting, but I don't have that right now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, in Appendix B in the CIP and in the project status report, it shows the remaining available budget for the new jail facility design and construction is just under 8.3 million, uh, but the project is also listed as on hold. And given that we're, we're back to community planning on this facility, do you anticipate any spending um, out of this uh, 8.3 million in fiscal 23? Uh, through the chair, I can uh, speak to that. There is uh, planning, even though it may not be the original scope, there is planning that um, it was initiated by the board earlier this spring to look at uh, uh, various needs. And the thought is, at least from my perspective, as the budget director, get, this would be a funding RFI. source for, 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 to, for that work and any follow-up the work that the board directs from that, those initial studies, because at this point we don't have another um, 
funding uh, source for that work. That's, that was my thinking as, as from a budget director perspective. Thanks, Greg. I would encourage you. Um, I don't think there's any way we'll be spending $8.3 million in the next year. As, as I know you've got some juggling to do uh, over the next few weeks, and, and I would like to recommend that as a, as a pot that you might look at for some more immediate needs that will be spent this year. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and finally, I think just uh, some comments on processes. Uh, as I mentioned at the last FGOC meeting, I am very interested in better transparency and board and public engagement on our capital planning processes. I, I did ask for an updated org chart uh, for fleet and facilities uh, last month. We haven't received that, and I'd like the board to receive that as an off agenda um, but by the end of next week, please, I want to make sure we have that in hand uh, well before budget. Will do. Thank you. Uh, also, in reviewing past FGOC meetings, uh, I see that my, my predecessors requested uh, many times, Cindy and Dave and then Cindy and Otto, um, many times that the capital plan and the six-month project status update be comprehensive, including parks, affordable housing, hospitals, and governmental buildings. Um, my team saw a, a model in San Diego County that um, I'll ask them to send to you that I would really encourage us uh, to consider as, as a benchmark and, and a best practice. They have a public engagement portal for capital planning that includes all county assets and a way for the public um, to request or comment on projects. We spend a significant amount of money on capital projects, and, and still this report doesn't provide the level of public visibility that I think capital investments uh, deserve. The June 2020 Harvey Rose ad audit on capital planning offered some specific recommendations for the six-month update that I would um, very much like to see included. Um, the, for, let me list those for you, and then perhaps Greta or James can tell me if I need a, a referral or if we can move ahead with this. The information, um, the recommendations that Harvey Rose made um, were including the, an original price tag and every increase in budget, as well as the original timeline and any delays. We should be able to see the operational plan, including ongoing revenue and expenses, uh, at least for large capital investments, and we can determine what large means. Um, TSS, the TSS item on the agenda was approved on consent, but I, I just want to point out um, my, my perception and my team's perception of some really good work on governance in that department. They have a committee composed of representatives from several departments that goes through a quantitative, quantitative ranking for departmental proposals and for capital investments. On the other hand, for capital investments, a much larger portion of our overall investment portfolio, we have a very tiny, I think, three-member um, administrative capital committee. And, and I, would like, um, I would like us to consider using something more akin to the TSS governance process um, for, for capital Supervisor, planning. Supervisor, may I just um, comment briefly Please. on that? Because I'm a part of mm -hmm. both of those governance oh, processes, and I think they may be a lot less different than might appear based on the descriptions you're reviewing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the role that um, Greg Eteria, Jeff Draper, and I play as the three-member capital committee does not mean we're the only folks who are around the table when we're discussing capital. In fact, actually, the group who participates in the capital planning process is far larger than um, participate in that TSS strategy um, committee. Uh, and so I think what one, one um, suggestion I would maybe have is um, in prior discussions on the capital process, we have a description of that process that was um, put together and an implementation of it that originates from a time when the county was of much smaller size, so the number of projects that were being considered um, was far smaller. Um, we've been adapting that process in real time, um, but it was, I think, interesting for me to walk into that process with fresh eyes and to say, I think we might have an opportunity here to sort of do some resetting, given the volume of, of, 
of projects. One other observation I would just make um, for the committee's consideration is um, the vast majority of the projects that are being considered in capital committee for um, investment are really in the um, keeping the lights on category, replacing things that have broken, um, you know, re-roofing, uh, a significant investment in re-roofing an existing building. And so I think one um, balance that we'll try to think through how best to strike and to bring forward to the board is not um, sort of losing the forest for the trees on what might be the actual new projects that we're investing in that might be of community interest in the vast forest of more maintenance-oriented capital projects and mm -hmm. trying to figure out a, a way to um, uh, also be able to efficiently provide you with the information you're looking for because some of the detailed um, uh, information on original timeline, original cost, cost increases might be of less interest to the board if we're talking about the re-roofing project example, although it could be of interest, but it takes a lot of effort to put together and maintain. Um, and so we'll think about also what's the, um, what's the best way to make sure we're getting you all the information you want without having staff spend a lot of time compiling information that may not be of as much interest to the board so that we can actually come back with um, robust and timely reports that, that cover all the information you're looking for. And we will look at that San Diego example, so appreciate yeah, th that. Thank you. I, I think that um, I didn't know, first of all, that more than three people uh, had a role there. So that's, to me, part of the transparency and communication uh, piece I have discovered, frankly, in a number of areas where I don't know what is happening, I then learn and am very pleased, but had been frustrated or anxious previously um, for uh, through not not knowing what that is. So, I, you know, can I, I give really, a concrete example there just yeah. to flesh that out? Um, um, to be specific, as it relates to, for example, um, our, our enterprise hospital system projects, the conversation we specifically had around prioritization of that set of potential capital projects included um, all of the healthcare facilities leadership from both FAF and the health system, Paul Lorenz, all of the planning team that works with the hospital system going through um, participation from the relevant OBA analysts who would be looking at the um, costs associated with projects both um, as originally budgeted and as they've evolved over time um, in a changing market and where the scope of the project may have shifted as, for example, we realized in opening up a wall, there was a lot more um, infrastructure investment that was needed um, for a particular facility where we've begun a project. So um, we will be happy to figure out how best to capture um, what is, I think, a much richer process than as is um, described at the very 30,000 foot level. It's functionally chaired by the three of us, but not comprised of the three of us. Thank you for all of that. I'm. Given the fact that board well, committee members and FGOC have asked for similar things over and over, I'm a little bit hesitant to uh, recommend sending this report on to onto the board today. Um, what what I what I would really like is is to see some action and movement. I love what you're describing, um, but I want to make sure that that's really tangible that you don't have to explain it every time. Um, that, you know, really thinking about, I do think it's very important to have a public representation of all of our county capital projects, as I, as I noted, including parks, affordable housing, hospitals, and governmental buildings. Ideally, there should be some section on, on the open data portal, um, an interactive map. Um, again, to, to your point, Greta, I think whether we are interested in a specific project or not, I think looking at trends and looking, um, you know, really for any information that the public may want, that it is important to have those original estimates, the increases uh, to the project cost, uh, the initial timeline, and any um, delays on timeline. Um, so just, I'm, I'm I'm thinking through this. I don't want to add a significant amount of work by asking for this every month, but I, I really think that there need to be improvements in this report before we move it ahead 
so that we're not having the same conversation in six months. Sure, that makes sense. We um, we had discussed at a prior FGOC um, us spending some time over the summer. I think we have scheduled a report back on um, potential revisions to the board policy that speaks to the um, the administrative capital committee and its process. I think mm -hmm. we can include as in our thinking and forthcoming recommendations reports on a reporting structure and cadence that um, we think is feasible for FGOC and then also um, try and put together something that responds to what I'm hearing from you about a more public facing um, regular um, method of uh, raising awareness of ongoing capital planning efforts and ongoing capital projects and investments and think about whether it's through the open data portal or through some other um, component that might be included in the um, the FAF website or, or some other public facing uh, vehicle what's the best way to capture um, a sense of, of of what what we're doing and what we're thinking about on the capital side including things that we know are um, significant community and board policy priorities like our behavioral health um, infrastructure investments. Excellent. Thank you for, for all of that, Supervisor Lee. Thank you for your indulgence. That was an extended um, period of questioning, but I, I really, I believe that this is the, the heart of the FGOC uh, oversight work that, that we do. So thank you for all of that. I, and I will recommend that we not forward this report to the Board of Supervisors, but that it come back to us, Greta, either in June or August, why don't, why don't we do August, um, in, in August to determine whether the recommendations, not just from us, but from the, the committee over time are being implemented and that there's a plan uh, going forward that will measurably expand transparency. I, I just want to clarify for the committee that this isn't an item that is an action item for forwarding to the board, just so there isn't confusion around that based uh, on your comments. There is, and now it's clarified. So regardless, then it will, I'd like we'll it to come back in August. We, we will come back in, um, in August. If we need a little bit more time, we may ask for that. I think September Given, given some of the, I think what we were planning to bring back, um, which was narrower, we were targeting um, August for that. Um, I'd actually, just thinking through some of the additional um, requests from today, I think September is probably a more realistic timeline. Then um, let's be realistic and, okay. and have it come back at the September meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do we need a motion on this one, um, James? Yes, I think that'd be appropriate. Okay. So that yes, I'll move approval, approval with, the, approval, yeah, exactly, right. with so the direction that I offered no. in my comments. I will second that. Um, and does that include 15 as well? Yes. It does. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, actually, the first one is actually relating to a, um, a request I requested about three months ago. Um, on an off-agenda report on the list of county buildings and the seismic safety conditions. And um, Straper, I think you've, you've heard me ask on this. And Doc Smith, at first thought it was something that was readily available, but certainly looks like there's more work it takes to put that together. Um, how, how soon do you think this could be made available? Supervisor Lee, I'm not, I, I seem to remember that we forwarded a report or a response uh, off-agenda on it, but I'll check. Okay. And yeah. if, we should be able to provide you at least a preliminary report within a matter of uh, just a few days to a month. Okay, yeah. that would be great. Um, because on item number 44, uh, also I see uh, on, on the <clears throat> list of capital projects is the seismic assessment of facilities countywide. This would be <clears throat> subsequent to this report that you provided me to have a more fidelity to actually look in each of these buildings further, is that right? That's, that's correct, yes. We would be looking at each facility and categorizing it in its appropriate, um, whatever seismic condition, so to speak. Okay, great. And how, how long do you think this will take, about a year or less? <clears throat> I'm guessing somewhere around six to eight months to great. actually finish it up. <clears throat> Good, yeah. I mean, if there's anything about capital improvement project that I'm very concerned about, given where we are, um, when, when you cannot get insurance from the insurance company, uh, you know that uh, they, 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 they figure that the risk is not worth taking, and, and which means that I think we're at a high risk level where we're not about 20, 30%. I've seen things like over 90 something percent that uh, 
that, that's coming. So, so I, I'm, I'm very concerned about making sure that we are um, safe, uh, at, at the very least to understand that the buildings would um, survive a quake so that th those occupants would be safe. Um, and if, if those buildings are determined not to have that, even that ca minimum capability, then they need to be evacuated uh, and, and get them moved to other, other places. So that's part of the reason I'm asking, I'm asking that question. Um, and on that note, would you say right now there's any specific buildings that you think, uh, like, wow, this, this one is one where I would not really want to put people in at this point that we have currently in the county? I, I, I won't say there is any building that we should be okay. uh, extremely worried about. I mean, are all, to say it differently, um, all county office buildings, are, we have a range of ages, right, of the different facilities that we've built. And certainly the seismic code has improved and improved and improved since 1972 and 88 and 94. So not everyone is meeting, not every building is going to meet the, you know, the 2023 uh, building code, if you will, for seismic safety. But most of the facilities that have been designed along the way in terms of normal office occupancies will survive an earthquake people will be able to move out of the building. They may not be able to go back into the building Correct. and use it for the purpose it was right. set there for. Yeah, that was uh, my concern. And, and obviously, our hospital buildings are pretty seismically strong as we continue to comply with uh, uh, the state's requirements, uh, the statutory requirements to raise the level of those facilities up because they're essential facilities. And then we have other facilities that are also essential, uh, police stations, for instance, the uh, sheriff's police, you know, uh, stations would be a part of that, as well as um, our county comm, and some of those kind of facilities are, are pretty safe, and they've been around for a fairly long time. So um, different strategy, stratifications, and we'll, we'll have to go through the list with you in some detail. Yeah, that would be great, and um, <clears throat> I certainly want to learn more about that, and also, um, in addition to that, we'd also talk about some of the purchases, like the O'Connor Hospital that we purchased, and I believe we do have some uh, some significant challenges in some of those buildings. There. Actually, we're, I think on June, I'm thinking on June 5th, mm -hmm. we should get, we're hoping to get our final sign off for the seismic uh, project that we have ongoing over at O'Connor, right. which will really help uh, that particular facility a lot. So, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, looking forward to that and, uh, and we can further dialogue on this one. Thank you. Um, second thing is um, relating to our favorite, Old City Hall, right next, next to us here. Um, we were talking about some type of a potential um, uh, discussion of historical landmark uh, designation and, uh, uh, and, and usage. And do you see what options the board might have for this building and land or something that we need to discuss in the future? Sorry, I, I, it's a little difficult to hear you. Sure, uh, I'm talking about the old city hall uh, building and uh, I just want to see what all the upcoming um, uh, milestone is gonna happen regarding what we're gonna do with that building and is there any some of the movement moving to uh, maybe historical landmark designation and whatnot. So I just want to hear from, because I've heard folks about from demolition to keeping it and all those other, uh, anything in between. Right, so, it's already on the county's inventory. Um, that's one of the things that when we last met the board on this topic, that, that was one of the reasons we were bringing it to that, mm -hmm. along with the EIR for possible demolition. Now that the board decided not to, uh, not to um, authorize um, or certify that EIR, so it currently remains um, unoccupied and there are no plans um, to do anything further at this time. So at this point, there's really no action on it until another decision needs to be taken by this board? The Correct. Old City Hall project is functionally basically on hold because there's no planned uh, use for that site at this time and uh, as the board is aware, the rehab of that building is basically not feasible. The board did not proceed with demolition, so that site's just on hold status at this time. Do we plan to come back to this board to have various options to look at it again? At some point in the future, but it's not one of the priority projects. As you can see from this capital plan, we have a very ambitious and significant capital program. As you heard from your colleague, where the board has provided very clear direction to prioritize behavioral health 
related concerns. Mm -hmm. And so administration has been responding to that direction from the board and this project is essentially on hold until those other priorities are handled. Okay, thank you. I'm glad, glad to know where we're at. And, and the building is secured mm -hmm. um, and it's monitored, so it is in safekeeping um, in the meantime. Great, thank you. All right, and that's all the questions I have for today. Um, and uh, we have a motion, we have a second, and let's go take the vote. Oh, I'm sorry, let's open a public hearing. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. We do have two Zoom speakers. We'll do two minutes. Yes, please, two minutes, perfect. Great. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. You will have two minutes. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I mean, I very rarely say this, but I am so, so excited and impressed by what I've heard today. I mean, it's taken from the realignment in 2012 to get to this conversation. It's taken 10 years, a decade. And I don't want that to be lost on the public. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Supervisor Allenberg and, and, and uh, Supervisor Lee for the work that you're doing with respect to the Rand Corporation and, and the facilities improvements and expansion of those beds. I mean, the people, the, there are, there's a person right now in the tent. There's a person right now in St. James Park that doesn't even know about this conversation and they are gonna be the beneficiary of this expansion. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank you. Now, secondly, about the uh, ARP funds. Now, this is gonna be financed with ARP funds, but you also need to find and start expecting that funding source for the maintenance of these of the expansion. So that needs to be accounted for. Thirdly, 650 uh, Bascom, that's owned by Barry Swenson. He owns that building, that's, that's his building. So I just wanted to note that. Uh, also, uh, the Old City Hall is a historical landmark. Um, and I would, and I wanted to start to be identified as such. The first female mayor, Janet Gray Hayes, the first Asian mayor, Norman Mineta, the first Chicano ever to legislate power in this city since 1846, Al Garza, and the first Mexican mayor of San Jose since 1846, Ron Gonzalez. That is a civil rights museum. And I'm gonna be talking about, uh, talking with PAC today um, about that. And we're going to re, so I would ask the uh, county council uh, when he becomes executive, you start referencing it as such, because we're gonna get it instituted as a civil rights museum. That belongs to us. The entire Chicano movement was went there. And for the first time we were able to exercise and challenge the institutionalized racism that we had ex experienced in this city. Also Norman Mineta. So you're gonna knock down. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorraine Zeller. Lorraine, you will have two minutes. Thank you, Supervisors Lee and Ellenberg, and I want to echo Paul Soto's um, gratitude for your work uh, in the behavioral health. Behavioral health. Um, I am concerned about the, and I have questions about the RAD, RAM study. Is it including all of the adult residential facilities in the county that accept people with uh, mental health challenges? They are not included on the dashboard, the bed capacity dashboard. That's only supplemental uh, board and care that contracts with the county. And also, I don't believe it includes the unlicensed board and care um, as referred to in the 2020 behavioral health management audit. So, Licensed board and cares, as you know, are closing because they can't, they can't meet their needs, their financial needs. Um, I think if we are able to support them, um, they will. But I'm also concerned about how do we count the people who maybe need to be in licensed board and care, but instead they go to these unregulated living and there is a need to count them as well, as they have levels of need as well. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Great, and that concludes public comment. Sure, thank you. Um, Greta, do you have uh, some comments? Sure, and actually I, um, I was gonna see, uh, some of the questions raised by the last speaker were actually issues that I can briefly address um, as part of the um, Chief Operating Officer report on this item, which I'm happy to just briefly speak to now sure, that, um, to, to, to address that item. Um, so 
as we've talked about a couple of times, um, administration is really focused on um, supporting RAND in the completion of its analysis, um, which will be presented to the board on June 6th, as well as continuing to um, plan for expansion in all of the areas we feel confident will be identified as um, ones where we need expansion. And I'll just name those um, briefly, which is we certainly know that we have um, what feels like a lot of pressure in our acute care settings, um, which are very overfull, but a lot of that pressure really being driven by the lack of subacute capacity that would then allow, I think, approximately 40% of the folks who are currently in acute care to move downstream, freeing up 40% of our acute care beds and thereby um, giving us more than, than perhaps the needed capacity at that level of care. Um, the other thing that um, I, I wanted to mention, which the last commenter very astutely observed, is it's very complicated to know um, how best to do an analysis of the type that RAND is undertaking and some specific choices that they as independent um, evaluators um, made around what scope of facilities to include in their assessment and um, just to flag a few examples of that complexity, one of which the last speaker mentioned is, um, as the board knows, we have uh, board and care facilities in the community where we um, have a lot of folks with significant mental health and substance use needs, either um, um, very active or, or more dormant because of treatment that they've been receiving, living in those settings. Some of those settings offer um, just support for activities of daily living, yet their residents are getting really significant outpatient treatment services. And so that's the combination of that uh, residential environment, support for activities of daily living, plus outpatient treatment together forms what's functionally a residential um, treatment option for, for a lot of folks, even though the residential environment itself is not providing the treatment, it's providing um, living space and support for activities of daily living. Um, some of those facilities receive patched funding, what we call patch from the Behavioral Health Department, where the, um, uh, the disability um, and SSI related income that a particular individual living in that facility may receive and providing a portion of it to that facility is insufficient for the facility to um, be willing to provide care for that person and behavioral health will want to provide them with that supported living environment plus outpatient treatment. So we'll provide a patch um, to meet the needs of that facility in order to serve that client. Yet still, again, it's not a therapeutic um, intervention. And so determining whether to count some of that um, investment by behavioral health as beds for purposes of, um, of, of RAND's analysis was complex. The primary focus of the analysis that RAND is doing is really on treatment facilities. So that would be acute care settings, subacute settings, and to the extent that we're talking about a boarding care or skilled nursing environment where there is a specific um, additional mental health component. Their analysis will also reference a lot of the other um, capacity that we have at lower levels of care that were not within scope for what they um, felt they could tackle on the aggressive timeline um, that we we needed for this assessment and that includes everything from permanent supportive housing um, where there's really intensive treatment and support provided to folks as well as housing um, things like uh, boarding cares where we're providing then a totally separate um, but significant outpatient treatment support and so we'll go into a lot of detail, um, and the RAND team is prepared to speak to what was included and what wasn't included. Another example I'll give is um, we have recovery residences where the behavioral health department's supporting um, sober access to sober living environments for folks strugg struggling with substance use treatment. However, that's not a treatment bed. It's a, it's a living environment that gets paired with outpatient treatment. The combination becomes what some would consider the functional equivalent of a bed for purposes of treatment. It's definitely a bed. They're also getting treatment, but they're not paired. So that would not be in scope for the substance use treatment beds um, that RAND was analyzing, in part based on how they were looking at the benchmark. So I could go into a lot more detail here, but I'll save it for um, June 6th, but I appreciate the comment. Um, and I'll just um, 
just also maybe uh, say a few more words. Another area where, as we've discussed, um, and this is also a preview of what will be coming to the board in much more detail on the 6th, another area where we've been looking um, to make really substantial um, expanded investments is in substance use treatment. That's not only at the capacity level, but also um, really looking at how to enrich our approaches for um, analyzing need and delivering care in both medical environments and specific behavioral health operated um, or community based substance use treatment options. So um, many investments being made on that front that will be described on June 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Um, all right, and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, just go ask for the vote. Thank you. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Now we're moving to item number seven, which is receiving report from Facilities and Fleet Department relating to energy audit efforts at the O'Connor Hospitals in Luis and also says, as a Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Dave Berry, uh, Chief of Facilities Planning. On, on Zoom link, we have Brad Vance, our utility analyst. Um, he's, he and I and, and Mr. Draper are prepared to answer any questions you have about the ledge file report. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, do we have any members of public like to speak on this item? We currently do not have anyone online, and it looks like no one in chambers as well. Great, thank you. I'll come close to the public hearing. Uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, do you have any questions on this item? Not on this item, thank okay, you. Okay, sure. Uh, so first of all, I just want to thank uh, Jeff and your entire FAF team for overseeing our county's efforts for energy efficiency opportunities throughout across our county uh, hospitals. Um, to me, it was very interesting to learn that we've identified over $41 million in potential savings if the county would implement these energy efficient measures across our three hospital campuses, which is clearly very significant. So it's not just green for the environment, but it's also green for our pocketbooks, right? And it's my understanding that most of these savings would be stemming from um, just simply implementing the LED uh, lighting uh, uh, changes uh, and HVAC along the chiller boilers, controls, and these pump upgrades. So I just want to say thank you very much for answering um, these questions from my office, uh, behind the scenes as well. Um, <clears throat> I also noticed that the, um, I guess the formerly called the DePaul Health Center, uh, open Morton Hill, uh, wasn't included uh, to the campus in the renovations occurring while the study was being conducted. Um, so when do you think, uh, what's the thinking behind this in particular? Yes, sir. Um, the reason we didn't do DePaul is because it was still under a pretty significant state of construction at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, there's still another major phase of construction that's planned down the road as we would build a subacute facility there or in, you know, remodel the interior for a subacute facility. Uh, we've incorporated a lot of, uh, we'll have incorporated a lot of the uh, Cal Green or the energy efficiency measures through that particular subacute project, if you will but we can give the facility another look after that project's over and see if there's anything else that we can do to make it better. So it's, it's down the road a little ways, if you will, probably three or four years. About three to four years from now is when you, when you look at it at that point. Okay, good. Um, I guess the, <clears throat> it was uh, explained to our staff that we currently don't have the funding for the phase two uh, and that we need to be able to identify some type of financing options or something like that. I would, uh, will defer quickly to uh, Mr. Aturia, but generally speaking, no, we don't have funding identified for these measures at this time. Mm -hmm. As we engage the ESCO uh, company mm -hmm. to look at this, part of their effort is to determine if they can offer a financing package that makes sense for us to move it forward, because you know the idea behind an ESCO is, is they do some of the improvements at their cost and then reap the benefits, uh, we get to share in the cost benefits of the improvements over time. So, um, but the county has over the past several years also uh, for energy projects, decided to pay cash because it's actually a better financing model for the overall investment. Okay. Uh, Greg, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, I, I think you covered it. When it gets right down uh, to looking at how to, how to finance it, we want to get into the details and see what's more ad advantageous. Uh, sometimes it's simply more advantageous for us to, to pay cash than use their finance mechanisms. Right, so the we, inherent rate of interest that is built into their financing models. Right, so we're talking about A is auditing what needs to be done, right, so this is what we have done. And so the next step, of course, is how, what, who will be doing the work, right, and how much it will cost to actually get it done, you know, uh, in, in whatever phases and put in our budget, 
Does, yeah, our our next about? step is to go meet with the, uh, uh, to select uh, an, es an ESCO using uh, the, uh, what's the, what's the code? <laughs> the, no, the 40, what is it called? The 40, uh, 4217 exception so that we can go directly to an ESCO uh, company mm -hmm. and, uh, and start to work with them on what, what, what the project could look like, what the financing could look like. So that's the next stage that we're going to. And once we have their answer back, then, then we'll, we'll have an internal discussion about the financing that they've proposed versus mm -hmm. cash financing. Would we be going through like an RFP to figure out who would actually do the work? No. It'll be uh, the, the 4217 uh, code allows us to uh, go directly to pick an ESCO at this point. At this point. Okay. All right. I mean, to me, it certainly makes sense to <clears throat> spend this money in order to save money uh, in so many ways. So I think it, uh, we definitely need to move forward sooner or later. So I would ask if um, you could maybe provide a report back to the next FGLC meeting um, and identified where we could potentially pull the funding sources that would help finance this phase two portion of the project, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And that would be my motion on that. Second. Okay, thank you. And, um, and very close public hearing, so I'll go ahead and uh, take the vote, please. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Okay, so we finished with seven. <clears throat> We've got eight on consent, so let's move to item number nine, which is the um, report from the Office of County Executive relating to Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, reimbursement for county COVID-19 pandemic <coughs> response effort. I believe we have uh, Martha Rapinski, a deputy county executive, uh, of course, Greg, again, uh, from our county budget director, um, let's see, who else is with you here, Mar Martha? With me today is Maria Oberg, the huh? controller treasurer. Great. Hello, Maria. So and please like go ahead. We have a few slides, if that's all right. Please. And we'll take questions. Uh, this is a joint report between Greg Grituria, Maria Oberg, and myself. Um, this is the joint quarterly report on all things COVID funding and FEMA reimbursements. Contributors to this report also include the Office of Supportive Housing and Public Health. Again, we have a brief presentation, then we'll take questions. Okay, very good. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Yes. So uh, this slide, you know, we have been expending significant amounts of money. Obviously, you've heard me say that before. We plan with a, there's a projected spend of about 1.4 billion, as you see on the slide, by the end of June. To date, the county has been obligated 62.5 million from FEMA, and we've received approximately 55.5 of that, as you can see there. And we've submitted 78 projects to FEMA worth 473.7 million. In addition, you'll recall that this year the, the cost share basis with FEMA is 90%, 10%, where FEMA provides 90% of the eligible costs and the county funds the remaining 10%. So under that funding scenario, there are 13 projects worth about 40 million under development and will be submitted to FEMA, <coughs> excuse me, FEMA by early November. What I wanna say about this slide is generally the county's COVID-19 response operations have been winding down, as you know. Um, costs have shifted significantly downward with the closure of the mass vaccination and testing sites um, and also the end of the COVID-related marketing campaigns and reduced staffing levels. Payroll remains a significant driver of the costs and a large portion of this amount is comprised of the cost of county staff who were diverted from their regular posts uh, to service disaster service workers. And then finally, most COVID-19 response activities have been successfully transitioned and embedded within public health. The county continues to play a central role, obviously, in managing all the impacts of the pandemic. And then as previously reported here and to the board, the county's strategy for pandemic management includes those four components that you see there on the slide. The, the main thing I wanna pull out here is that public health continues to perform primary response activities with ongoing support being provided by uh, the Office of the County Executive, Office of Emergency Management, OSH, and um, our Valley Health Center. So finally, you have, you have all the details of these five different components in your report. So I won't go into them here, but just know that um, 
there that we continue to track these five areas as we reported to you in the last quarterly report. And I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there because there's a, there's a wide variety of information in your packet. So we'll go ahead and take questions at this point. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Supervisor Zillenberg. Thank you. I, am. I do. Thank you, Martha and Maria and the rest of your team. As funds are received from FEMA, are they deposited into a particular account in finance? Yes, like, like all revenues they, uh, of this type, they'll be deposited into the controller treasurer's office and tracked the way we do other revenues. Right, thanks. That, so given that this is gonna play out over many years, how do we track not just the reimbursements as they come in, but how those funds are later applied to county needs? That's an excellent question, and you're right. This will take years. Um, what, I, what I do want to remind uh, the public about today here is that besides it taking years, we're doing everything we can now in terms of documentation to avoid any clawbacks that um, when, we do, when the audits do happen. And the other point important here is while we may claim a certain dollar amount, we may not get that entire amount we requested. Um, and so, you know, as I said, as these revenues come in over the, in the coming years, um, we'll be collecting those and tracking them. And through the uh, committee chair, if I may, too, a little bit of, of a reminder, the claims for FEMA are for reimbursement for the use of county discretionary dollars to, to respond, knowing that the majority of costs were funded initially by other sources, CARES Act, for example, um, and, um, uh, some specific federal and state funding for uh, public health uh, response, et, et cetera. And, and as the board knows, a number of difficult decisions were made back in 2020 and 21 to cut back on other costs in order to generate the discretionary dollars that they had to pay for the, that initial response. So when uh, the revenues do get finalized and determined by, by FEMA, and, and we do expect they'll come in pieces uh, o over multiple years, it's really just a reimbursement to the, to the county, to the boards, for the investment of discretionary dollars in the past. So when they do uh, come into the, the general fund, of course, and the board will be, and, and, and everyone will be notified. Just as a reminder, they're gonna be discretionary in nature, just like property tax and sales tax and it'll, it'll all be part of you know, the discretionary revenue uh, that comes in at that particular year, and, and it'll be up to the, you know, the board at that time to, as they prioritize the use of all discretionary revenue. This will just simply be uh, uh, amongst that. I don't know if that helps. It's just a reminder that it's discretionary in nature, isn't restricted to any particular uh, purpose for whatever year it comes in. And perhaps that helps address the, the question. Um. Thank you for that. That I think is more true for FEMA uh, than for ARPA. And I, I would um, make a motion and, and, and direct this, the appropriate team to come back with a report to FGOC in August, specifically on the ARPA and FEMA spending to show what has been allocated through the fiscal 23-24 budget, how that matches the board approved spending plan in November 2021, and I realize that's for ARPA, um, not fully for, for FEMA, and any remaining funds that are pending or might be repurposed. We could do that. Great, thank you very much. Can, can I just get clarification yes, on what, what, are, sure. what you're seeking with respect to FEMA? Because the, the request with respect to ARPA makes sense, yeah, the, but it, not, it, not, it doesn't make sense to me with respect to FEMA. As I think it through, FEMA may make less sense because that came in. It's just re it's reimbursing for costs the general, and it's general funds. General funds, and there's no spending plan from the the board. So let me just uh, amend that and limit it to the ARPA work. Thank you. And so we can do that for ARPA. Thanks, but but thinking about how the board learns when FEMA reimbursements are coming back in, how will those be 
identified, even if, of course, they come in, they're fungible, they're general funds, but I'm interested to know, have we been reimbursed 20%, 80%? I, I think these reports are the best is mechanism the best for that. that because they show in one of the tables in this report, right, it shows how much has been requested, how much has been obligated, how much has been received from FEMA, and, you, and by category. And so that can continue to be tracked. And we're going to need to, I think, continue to push on advocacy related to that. And right. there's the audit issue, um, and we will be needing to track this for decades because... Um, it is well known that for major incidents, the audit issues associated with FEMA, even after you receive the money, uh, take many decades to close out. Uh, and given the scale nationally on COVID, I'm sure it'll take even longer. Right. Um, thank you. Is this information kept somewhere that's publicly accessible, or does the public learn about it through the reports that we are getting? I believe there's a dashboard. Yeah, there's a dashboard online. Thank you. Will you I, will, I will find that link and I will share it myself. Thank you very much. Yes, and <clears throat> the question I just want to highlight, Martha, is just the bottom line is most important, of course, how much we actually got received, right? And we're looking at only $55.5 million. Um, sounds like a lot of money, but when you look at how much money we're expected to claim, we're talking about 513 million. We have resubmitted 400, over 470 million <clears throat> and only getting 55 and a half million. So my concern here is what can we do, if, if any, <clears throat> to, to expedite the reimbursement process? Would this be a situation where we need to contact our, let's say, say call your congresswoman to, to make this happen? I'm going to uh, go ahead and see if uh, county council wants to weigh in. but. Sometime, I want to say last year, we did inform our delegation of our, the activities that were going on at that time as in an advisory capacity. And as Mr. Williams said earlier, it may make sense to continue that advocacy. I don't know if you had something to add. Yeah, I, I think it does. I think, it, I think um, well, recognizing that this is a national issue and that entities across the nation are making reimbursement requests. Um, I do think, nonetheless, it makes sense for there to continue to be advocacy with our delegation, in particular because, as, as this committee is well aware, our county took a very um, all-of-county effort in responding to the pandemic and ran a testing and vaccination operation that far exceeded other jurisdictions across the United States. Therefore, our costs eligible for reimbursement are higher. And so we look a little different than other entities. But we look different because of the different services that we provided, because we ran, for example, the largest vaccination site in California at Levi Stadium, for in just one example. Um, and so it's being able to articulate that and have our delegation articulate that with uh, FEMA, I think is helpful. It's not going to hurt, certainly. I don't think um, we're under any illusions that outreach uh, when probably every congressional district is reaching out to FEMA is going to do something unique, but, I th but it is well worth pursuing. Okay, so now I'll ask. I, I'm sorry, no, ahead, if I please. may add to, to Mr. Williams' comments, we did send a letter to Zolofgren this week, and we have letters pending to the other members of our delegation. So in addition to the, what we did last year, we have a pending right now as well. Okay, good. Yeah, please, if you could CC us a copy of the letter, I certainly appreciate it. And, yeah, they are uh, going to your offices yeah, as well. Right. Yes. Perfect, yeah. I want to make sure that uh, we are coordinating and working together, because let's say the next time we see the congresswoman, we could reiterate that point and and face to face so so uh, making sure we all seeing the same tune so yeah <clears throat> okay good yeah so long this is being continued I just want to make sure we are using our best efforts to try to expedite this this process yeah thank you okay uh, let me open up the public hearing anybody would like to speak on this item we currently do not have any speakers okay all right I'll go ahead and close the public hearing if that's the case we have a motion and a second let's take a vote Great. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. Yes. 
And Chairperson Lee. Yes, as well. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving along, uh, item 10 is on consent. So we move to item 11, which is consider recommendations relating to fees for plumbing certificate of competency applications. Supervisor Lee, if yes. you're amenable, I would um, begin with a motion. I'm not sure, thank you for being here, but not certain we need the presentation. I, I would recommend moving forward with option B, uh, which is in line with the Board of Plumbing Examiner's uh, recommendation to subsidize the fee for plumbers to be uh, certified. The amount of $65,000 to be absorbed by the county is, is quite minimal compared to the impact the fee reduction may have on those going into the profession. So if you're in agreement, I would be happy to have a second on that motion. Yeah, I guess I, I would like to ask a little bit of further questions uh, of the different options Absolutely. here. So if I, I might just ask uh, <clears throat> the, the staff if you could uh, maybe go through the couple of options for us. I'd really appreciate it. And you're here. And, and introduce yourself, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Curtis Boone, Assistant Clerk of the Board. Uh -huh. Kathy Taylor, Management Analyst. Uh, Stephanie Simonick, Board Cl Clerk Lead. Yes. Iris Cano Salvatier, Senior Accountant. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. So um, fundamentally, there's two primary options. Uh, the fee that is charged by the vendor for the written portion of the exam uh, is going to exceed the amount that is currently collected. So our office calculated full cost recovery. Uh, both for the vendor uh, portion of the um, fee and the, um, uh, the, the staff work required to support the process. That amount comes out to $342 per exam. The uh, amount charged by uh, National Inspection Testing and Certification Corporation will rise to 175 So that is... Um, the amount that the Board of Plumbing Examiners would prefer to set it at that would not reflect any sort of uh, cost recovery for uh, county work, but it would cover the, the amount that is charged by the vendor. Uh, theoretically, it does not need to be set at either of those numbers. Uh, we could set it between those numbers. I think we have a, a, a cap at uh, 342 because we can't charge more than cost recovered. Uh, and then the other piece, just in the context of what the Board of Plumbing Examiners asked for, uh, was not only to absorb, um, for the county to absorb the, the current staff costs, but also to absorb uh, any further vendor increases over the next uh, six years. Okay, good. If, <clears throat> if I can share a few thoughts at the appropriate Please, time. Please, yes, go ahead. Um, so, so when I looked at this item, it, it raised, I think, um, a few a few thoughts in my mind that speak to how uh, sometimes we have handled fee issues in the county in a way that I think has um, um, been a little problematic. So if you look at the history behind this, the last time this fee was increased was December of 2004. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, haven't increased this fee to account for any inflation at all since that time. That's a long time ago. Right. And probably, I don't know the exact number, but inflation adjusted, the 150 would probably be somewhere in the mid 200s range, just back of the envelope in my head. Uh, but obviously that's a knowable, discrete number. Uh, I think the practice of not in inflationarily adjusting these fees on a regular basis puts the county in a problematic situation. While any given individual fee uh, may look like a small dollar amount, in aggregate, the failure to get cost recovery for operating these programs imposes general fund costs that come at the expense of aggregate funding available for board priorities and for safety net services that the county is providing. Whereas these are really discrete programs where uh, the, the theory behind these discrete programs is supposed to be basically cost recovery. So my recommendation to the committee would be um, not necessarily to jump it to the full cost recovery of 342, but given that it's been flat at 150 since 2004, would be to adjust the fee based on the consumer price index change since December of 2004 
Uh, that'll probably land somewhere between the 175 and the 342. Like I said, back of the envelope, it's probably around mid 200s. Mm -hmm. That would ensure coverage for the actual external vendor cost, which I think is really important, mm -hmm. uh, and provide slight cost recovery, though not full cost recovery for the staff time that's being provided. Uh, but then on a going forward basis, this along with other fees, we should have, I believe, a plan in place because when you increase them on a periodic basis, it doesn't necessarily have to be annual, but on some regular right. basis that's right. not, uh, you know, going back to 2004, you're talking about almost, you know, 20 years at this point. Exactly. Um, we're then keeping pace with that, just like we do on lighting district, vector control district, mm -hmm. you know, sewer, water, other things in the community. Um, but I think that's really more appropriate for these types of programs. So that would be my recommendation to the committee. Okay, thank you, Ms. Williams. So uh, uh, on that note, I'm going back to Supervisor Ellenberg. Would you be interested to uh, amend your motion to doing it through um, cost adjusted to inflation instead? Of I, I'm happy to withdraw it, and I think it didn't get a second anyway, and I'd be interested to hear the way you, you word it. Well, let me try to do it, uh, and Ms. Williams, if you help me, I've tried to make the motion to go ahead and make a recommendation to the board to increase the fee. Um, to using the cost uh, adjusted inflation since 2004, uh, based on the, I guess it would be the CPI. Yeah, the Bay Area the, CPI, Bay Area CPI rate. adjustment since the December rate. 2004. Right. <clears throat> uh, uh, moving forward in order to the, uh, match the actual cost uh, to, to for the, at, at bet <clears throat> to for, for this new fee that we are uh, uh, recommending. So if that's something that's acceptable to a second, yeah, I, th I think our uh, county council is, is pretty persuasive on this one, and I appreciate the, the further context. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm up for a second. Um, have I opened public hearing yet? Yes, we did already. We do not have okay. any speakers. Right, no speakers on that, and if that's the case, I uh, have a motion and a second, and let's, uh, let's take the vote. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's see, we have the verbal report from Chief Operating Officer. I know you were uh, speaking earlier, but is there anything else to report, Greta? I don't have anything else to highlight today. Great. I have a qu just yeah. one additional uh, question. Yes, uh, Greta, do you, do you know when the um, returnship program um, referral is going to, to come back? I don't off the top of my head. I'll see if I can get a quick answer to you on that via email. Okay. Thank you. It, it, it has been, been quite a while, and I'm hoping to see that before the end of the summer. Understood. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, moving on from 12, we have item number 13, which is receiving the monthly legislative report from the Office of Intergovernment Relations. Good morning, uh, Chair Lee and President Ellenberg. This is David Campos. Uh, my apologies for doing this report remotely, but I'm, uh, it's a vacation day. I'm technically in Los Angeles for the statewide Democratic Convention, and I am joined uh, by Danielle Christian, who is uh, in chambers, who will be assisting me with the, the slides. And so let me begin by uh, thanking the board for the opportunity to present to you uh, on the work that has been going uh, in Sacramento by our intergovernmental relations team. And we are trying to engage the board as much as we can. And one of the ways to do that is by having these uh, reports on a regular basis at this committee. So we appreciate the opportunity. If you can begin with the next slide, please. The, the goal here is to increase the County of Santa Clara's presence and visibility in Sacramento. I think it's fair to say that up to now, a lot of the work that has been done in Sacramento has been behind the scenes. And we are trying to make sure that we have the presence, the visibility that we believe we need to have as the largest county in Northern California uh, the sixth largest in the state and 
the county with the second largest county budget in the state of California. As was laid out in the legislative file, our focus has been uh, on four fronts, and uh, I want to just quickly identify what they are. First, uh, in the area of legislative uh, work and, and uh, sponsoring or co-sponsoring bills, uh, we have uh, sponsorship of five legislative proposals and three co-sponsorships. Uh, and, uh, and I'll say more about that shortly. We also, besides pushing legislation, uh, we have also engaged on key policy issues that are being uh, discussed in Sacramento. Uh, key among them, of course, is the work around behavioral health. Uh, the third piece, which is uh, something that we hope to do more of uh, going forward, is making sure that we engage in the budget and we have actually submitted budget requests uh, to members of our delegation, uh, uh, five requests, three of which actually made it through the process of being submitted uh, to the legislature. And then the last piece, and this is something that, uh, you know, we uh, are still working on and are grateful to the leadership of President Ellenberg uh, in, in this effort, is to try to uh, help organize the 10 members of our delegation into an informal Santa Clara Legislative Caucus. Next slide, please. As you can see, uh, we have five bills that we have uh, sponsored. Uh, I am happy to provide more detail on each one of those bills, uh, but I'm happy to report that those bills have been moving forward. Uh, they have made it through the first, all of them have made it to the first uh, house um, four of them are in the assembly and have been referred to various committees uh, right now. Uh, and uh, one of them is in the state Senate, uh, where it's also referred to a number of committees. And uh, this is probably the most aggressive uh, list of bills that we've had uh, for quite some time. And I'm happy to report uh, that it's going very well. If you can go to the next slide, please. And those are the county sponsor bills, uh, which uh, also are moving forward. Uh, one of them is actually for third reading in the Senate floor. That's uh, SB 10, uh, uh, SB 642, uh, which provides county council with civil enforcement authority over hazardous waste violations. Uh, right now, it's uh, before two committees in the state assembly. And I will turn uh, to Danielle Christian to say a little bit about AB 1387. Thank you, thank you, David. Danielle Christian, Legislative Manager. We are um, a co-sponsor with the City and County of San Francisco on AB 1387, which as you see, would establish a three-year grant-based pilot program. The bill made it through its first policy committee and was referred to the Assembly Appropriations Committee where it was placed on the suspense file. And unfortunately, it was not one of the measures that made it off of the suspense file. Mm -hmm. So the uh, quote in Sacramento is that it died on suspense. Thank you very much. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. And uh, I have to say that a lot of the time uh, that we have put in Sacramento has been spent on working on some of the key policy issues that are being developed in Sacramento. Uh, uh, specifically SB 43 by Senator Susan uh, Eggman, uh, as well as the uh, reforms that have been proposed by Governor Newsom uh, and then in the area of homelessness. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, President Ellenberg for being very engaged uh, in, in those discussions, especially SB 43 and MHSA reforms. And uh, I'm happy to report on SB 43 uh, that we had a very productive meeting with the author of, of that legislation, Senator Eggman. Uh, we proposed amendments. Uh, so far, the only county and, and quite frankly, the only uh, major uh, legislative player in Sacramento that has actually proposed something. Uh, and we had a follow-up meeting just the other day, which was very productive, where the senator indicated that there is an openness to the proposals that we put forward. No commitment, but certainly an openness. And right now we're working to get other players. Oops. 
I think that he is frozen on Zoom. Just give it one moment. Yes, it does appear that he has lost connection. Danielle, I'm not sure if you're able to proceed while we're waiting for David to reconnect, but if so, that would be great. Sure. Um, so as outlined in your legislative file, the county provided some comments on Mental Health Services Act modernization. That's one of the, it is a proposal that the governor has put forward, but without a lot of detail other than this is something he'd like to do. So we, working with the Office of County Council and the Behavioral Health Department, provided some comments on the priorities that CSAC has been advocating for in that space. In the space of homelessness, we had Consuelo Hernandez, the director of the Office of Supportive Housing, participate in a joint informational hearing on the Senate side um, to provide information about our partnership with the city of San Jose related to our response to unhoused people in our community. So just another example of how we are increasing our visibility and our presence in Sacramento and providing information to people beyond our delegation about our efforts here in Santa Clara County. We also submitted some state budget requests to members of our local delegation, three of which have been submitted to the Legislative Budget Committees. Um, they're listed up here on your slide. We, they're in the space of the faith-based reentry program. Um, also, the, the Culinary Academy that the reentry program is putting together, and also a self-initiated request that Senator Cortez put together that we provided extensive information on and in, in, in its development is money for a guaranteed basic income pilot program for unhoused high school uh, students. We provided two other requests to members that were not forwarded to the legislative budget committees. One was for a farm worker housing rehabilitation and electrification pilot program, and another for an evidence-based gun violence interruption and prevention program. The feedback we received um, is something that we're taking under advisement and, and seeing if these are proposals that perhaps we can um, raise a little bit more information on and, and demonstrate their potential impact and perhaps consider proposing again next year. As David mentioned, we ha have been working with the members of the Santa Clara County Cauc Santa Clara County delegation to form a caucus that is a little more focused on the county of Santa Clara. As he indicated earlier, we are the most populated county in Northern California, the sixth largest in, Cal in the state. We have more than 1.9 million residents. We have the second largest county budget in the state. And 10 members of the legislature have districts that are in or containing a part of our county. So we're, we're hoping to, through uh, President Ellenberg's leadership, to, to get something that's moving where there's a little bit of a, of a laser focus on Santa Clara County, and we're doing that advocacy through the existing Bay Area Caucus and leveraging the, the leadership and the influence of those individuals there. And like my back. apologies, I am back. Uh, the computer crashed on me right as I was presenting, so my apologies to, to the board. Uh, just wanna highlight a couple of things that we are looking to work uh, going forward. Uh, we are continuing to emphasize our work with other partners, including CSAC, uh, which is a very important player, as well as the urban counties, to make sure that there is more of a county voice around so many important issues that are that are you know being proposed, that are being discussed in Sacramento. And you know, just uh, as an illustration, I uh, was in Sacramento. I'm in Sacramento every Wednesday. And last Wednesday, there was a press conference that was held by the big city mayors, uh, which is a very powerful press conference where the mayors from all of the big cities talked about the importance of giving cities more resources to deal with homelessness. And obviously they have a very compelling case and very important point to make. But one of the things that was missing in that presentation is the very important role that counties play in that area. And I really believe that we need to do more to ensure uh, that the county voice uh, is presented. And the last thing that I would say is for, our, uh, for us to have the level of engagement that we want, we need to engage as many county partners as we can. And that's really, that really requires educating 
county agencies and, and county leaders in the different departments about how the legislative process works to make sure that we are presenting legislative proposals in a timely fashion, to make sure that we propose budget requests early on, and to make sure that we are present in, in Sacramento. And one of the things that I'm very pleased to have seen in the last couple of weeks is that our, our folks from you know, supportive housing have gone to testify on housing. Uh, and we are leading on so many issues. We just need to make sure that the state knows it. So with that, I will end the presentation and happy to take any questions. And again, thank you for, the, for this opportunity. My apologies for the technology issues. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Danielle, and thank you, David. Uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, do you have any questions? Thank you. I uh, both, uh, thank you. That was an excellent presentation, David and, and Danielle. I, I know this is a monthly report. I'm not going to ask for it to be pulled every month, but I really think that um, this work is so important and really deserves to be, be sunshined. Um, the bills that, that we, are, we have brought forth have the potential to have really significant impacts on our county budget, on, on our operations, and really glad to see the increased advocacy of our IGR team. Uh, David, you made a lot of really good comments that, that mostly I just want to reflect. We have the opportunity, if only we take advantage of it ourselves, to have a significant voice and influence in Sacramento, because, not only because of our size, but frankly because of our resources. We have so much expertise. Um, uh, Senator Eggman is working with, oh, I just forgot her name, from County Council's office. Megan Wheelahan. Megan, Megan Wheelahan. Wheelahan, yes. Um, because she understands the conservatorship issues. So a lot of what we need to do, of course we need to be strong advocates, but we also need to tell our story. We don't need to do less, but we need to talk more. So one of the, the pieces, as and I'll look to James for this as the um, incoming county executive, um, communications, robust communications, is going to be a significant part of this. Our 10 um, delegation members do not know nearly enough about a lot of the excellent work that is being done here. And I want that expertise to be known so that we are turned to as experts to testify, to advise on, on bill language, um, you know, to be a, a I don't want to say a force to be reckoned with, but to be a valuable voice um, where things can't go forward without hearing us. So for everything David and Danielle said, yes, thank you, more of this, and add a strong, please, um, communications expert to that team. I wholeheartedly agree with the importance for communications, and if I could just add a couple other thoughts. Um, um, I look forward to, uh, I already know many folks, of course, in our delegation, but I look forward to, to getting to know the rest of the county's delegation better as well as I step into a new role as the county executive uh, and feel like there is so much more we can do in this space, and it's so critical. One of the things that people don't often realize is because counties are subdivisions of the state, so many bills affect counties in ways that they don't affect other types of local governments, just by volume and by significance. And uh, our ability to weigh in and seek, uh, clar even just clarifying amendments sometimes, uh, can make a huge difference in our ability to actually effectuate the policy intent of the legislature. And there's not a lot of folks that are working on those bills that necessarily have um, the responsibility, awareness, understanding of the on-the-ground operation that it takes to get done uh, what they're trying to accomplish. And I have found over the years and have heavily participated in the legislative process over many years, uh, that there is usually great receptivity to our engagement, especially if it's early on enough in the process. So we look forward to having a much more robust presence. I'll add on that front, that I'll just share with the committee one more legislative update. Uh, Tony Lopresti and I were up in Sacramento on Monday with the city attorneys and county councils from the largest offices.
uh, in the state that have large civil enforcement programs. Most of those city attorneys are elected officials. Um, and it was a great opportunity to, for uh, us to collectively have a presence in, in Sacramento as well. And just another example of, of some of the additional efforts we're making to, to have some visibility uh, and be an active, uh, more active uh, participant in the legislative process. That's really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speaker on this issue? We do not have any speakers. Okay, go ahead and close the public hearing. Yeah, I just want to echo the same uh, um, sentiment. Uh, great report here, uh, David and Daniel, um, and knowing what uh, the our partners are doing up in Sacramento is so crucial. We certainly, are, and I was fortunate, you know, my predecessor right here uh, on the board is now a state senator. Uh, Cortez, along with uh, um, Senator Wahab, who used to be a county employee. So we have two folks who actually work in the county and, and, and understand what we do, which is fairly rare, honestly. Um, and I would say that the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the partnership is so important. Um, a lot of times, as we all know, we've, we've done a lot of good work in the county, but telling the stories is usually where we're lacking on. And so I think having the ability to do that uh, as well with our partners up in Sacramento to make sure that they know what we're doing and that we're, we're working you know, hand in hand to make sure that these policies are being implemented and getting the funding, right? Because much as a lot of funding we get from feds and the state. So uh, this, this is something important. And I, I also want to um, say, um, how important it is for us to be involved with the house issues. So having a big city mayor up there talking about on house issues is of course important, but leaving out the county is a huge hole, uh, as David's mentioned, because uh, when it comes to house issues, a lot of the mental health, substance abuse, uh, those type of issues clearly is within our jurisdiction and, and our input is, is, is crucially important. Um, and I think sometimes with, with the governor, who was the former mayor of San Francisco. San Francisco is unique in the sense that it's a county and city of San Francisco, which is really on its own, right? But it's not the way in the other major cities. And so that's why I think us at the table is extremely important. Sometimes we need to be there to remind them. And now I might see him this weekend. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, and uh, along with that, um, I would say, yeah, these are some really uh, great, great, uh, Update, uh, and of course these are the cycles. We have one year and two year bill cycles, and so please keep us posted and, and uh, uh, really looking forward to it. And if the occasion arises that uh, any of our staff or any of our supervisors even uh, testimony or, or input is necessary, please uh, let us know. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Daniel. And that's all I have. All right. and. Uh, there's no uh, motion on this one, so I think this basically takes us to the end of the meeting. Our next meeting is currently scheduled for, let's see, um, I'm sorry, yes, that's right, it should be June 22nd, uh, also at 10 a.m. Uh, at the Board of Supervisors Chambers right here. And I'll see you in June. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>